Hello, I'm Lexi. I'm Meg. And welcome to Script in Hand, the podcast where two friends and theatre directors delve into plays and talk text. We are finally doing this! <laughs> it's happening. It's happening. It's happening. We've been talking about this for like a year and finally got our asses into gear and decided we're going to talk about plays because that's what we both love to do. Very exciting times. Exciting times. So, for our first one, what do we think about our first one? What were we going to pick, Meg? You tell me. Well, this was quite an easy choice, wasn't it? Because this mm. is a play that we both absolutely adore um, and we actually want to do it in the future together. So I think it was quite a quite an easy first choice, really, wasn't it? It was. I thoroughly enjoyed rereading it as well. And the play is... The play is Ross and Rachel by James Fritz. Yay! I love this play so much. And it is published by Nick Hearn Books. First produced by Motor at the Assembly George Square Theatre as part of the 2015 Edinburgh Festival Fringe. So it's quite interesting how I came about this play, really. Um, you tell. It's a very... Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a crazy story. So I... My friend Alex was travelling across Canada. Um, she was on her own and she was taking the train... Um, east to west or west to east? I don't know. One of those. <laughs> one of those, and, one um, of those directions. <laughs> she, she met James on this train because he was also travelling on his own. Um, and they became friends. And then about maybe six months, a year later, he was like, oh, I've, I've got this play, by the way, if you want to come and see it. So she just said to me, Meg, do you want to come see this play? And I just blindly went into this thinking, do you know what? It's something to do. It's a night out. So I went to the Lowry Theatre in Manchester on... Well, I can tell you exactly when it was, actually. It was the um, 16th... No, the 30th of June, 2016. Um, and the reason I know the exact date is because after I saw this show, I immediately told everyone about this. And so I was even, yeah, able to look back on emails that I sent then. That's so cool. I didn't actually realise you'd seen it live when all yeah. the time we've talked about it. Have you not? Oh. <laughs> Did I just forget to mention that? You may have done. It's totally fine. <laughs> and then it went on to be performed at the um, New York at the 59E59, if I'm saying that right, theatre, as part of the Brits off-Broadway season before mm-hmm. it did that UK tour in 2016. So it's been around a bit. It has indeed, yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what the play is about? Yeah, so I think the blurb on the back of the edition I've got here actually does it a lot of justice. So it says, The play is a dark and uncompromising play about romance, expectation and morality. Um, It's really interesting because you would kind of assume from the title, Ross and Rachel, that it has some connection to Friends. And it does. However... I went to go see this uh, show as someone who is a massive fan of Friends, who loves it. My friend Alex, she has never actually watched Friends, believe it or not. Um, So she had no reference to kind of take that with. But it made no difference whatsoever. Um, It works on two levels. So if you're a fan of Friends or if you're not a fan of Friends, you get all of the references. Um, It is really clever in that way. But essentially, so the play is a one-person play. Um, I'd say one woman because I saw it done by a woman, but the play doesn't actually say it has to be a woman's voice no it says in the stage directions at the very start this is a play with two voices for one performer yeah so and it also says that the performer must use their own accent which i just think is absolutely stunning so i think if if you if you were given this script as an actor without that you might be like it's ross and rachel i must do an american accent um mm. but no I love a natural accent. Mm-hmm. We love, we stand an accent. Well, I love what you said about your friend not picking up on it, because I found a quote by uh, James Fritz which says, it's not about this couple, but not not about them. That's exactly true, yeah. So a little bit about James Fritz, I think, is in order as well. So James Fritz is his little potted bio from his uh, agent's website. Thanks, Berlin Associates. Uh, James Fritz is a multi-award winning writer from South London whose plays for stage and radio include Four Minutes, Twelve Seconds, Parliament Square, Ross and Rachel, Start Swimming, The Fall, Comment is Free, Death of a Cosmonaut and Lava. I tried to do that in one breath and failed. Uh, (laughs) He's done a lot of plays. (laughs) He's done so much. And he's won the Critics Circle Theatre Award for Most Promising Plays. Playwright, a Bruntwood Prize for Playwriting, and the Emission and Tinniswood BBC Audio Drama Awards. Not a bad CV to have under the belt. <laughs> He's not doing too bad, is he? So, let's talk about the play. And I love what you said already you about... This is one of the questions I already had to put to you mm-hmm. about this. So, every performance I've read about in doing this research for this 
has been a female performer. Yeah. What would it be like? Has a male performer taken this role on? Or what would it be like with a male doing it? It would be so interesting. I was thinking about this earlier today, actually. Um, because it is equally, you know, you have that female voice and then you have the male voice. So there's no absolutely no reason why it has to be a female actress. But, yeah. I don't know the answer to that. I think I would have to see it myself or I would have to... I don't I mean, it's a rubbish answer, isn't it? But... What do you think? It's really interesting. So for all we say, to go a little bit into detail about what it's about, it's this couple who could be Ross and Rachel, who could not. It's about um, what happens after if your happily ever after doesn't follow the rule book. Yeah. And the male character, uh, the male character uh, gets a brain tumour. And then it's following that progression of the illness and them finding out along the way or she, the female character, finding out actually I don't want to be with him but I can't leave him while he's like this and this isn't what I wanted. It was just because everyone told us we should be together. And him thinking that they're absolutely perfect for each other and that it gets a bit bleak. Basically she should kill herself at the same time then it'll be really romantic that they'll die together and it's really freaking dark near the end. And she just goes, you what? (laughs) Yeah, uh, no, No, not I'm not going to do that. But he comes across, there's so many moments in this which are really ick from the mo- from the male voice. I'm going to read some of these lines out which I've just mm. marked as ugh. So, she's a prom queen and she belongs to me. Doesn't that make, that make you feel great about the world? Ick. Um, th- that woman belongs to me and I can't believe my luck. Ick. And the value he places on Rachel's, she says in inverted commas, looks. Um, my wife, she's, she's fucking beautiful. She is. Don't you want to see actually no no way i have a younger photo it's so cringe that's disgusting (laughs) it's really bleak and i don't know how i how i'd feel or how it would feel watching a man say those lines where if it's a woman saying it as a male voice does that remove some of that ick factor slightly from it where it becomes uber creepy if a male is delivering that yeah i think it depends what impact you want to make because I think it would be a lot a lot worse and it would be a bit like oh what are you doing that's gross um but then potentially that's the impact that you want to make yeah it would have a totally different effect on the audience wouldn't it is it kind of in a way anti-feminist to cast a man in that role saying those words though I don't know it's a really tricky one it's so interesting I think if I was casting this and making the decision of whether she is a male actor or a female actor, then I would probably not make that decision. Although this is kind of a reflection of how I do cast everything, so maybe that's slightly different. No, tell tell us about how you cast things. So I, 99% of the time, would not put a gender to a character unless it was obviously quite necessary. And I would just ask anyone to audition for the part. It doesn't matter what your gender is. And then I would just kind of cast the best person for that. So whether it would be a case of making the decision early on as to this actor having to be female or not, or whether it would be you open the audition up to any gender and then whatever you think works best for that particular human being. (laughs) I don't know. It's tricky. It's a tricky one with this because, like you said, there are the certain phrases like that that are quite derogatory. I wonder if anyone has done it and I've just not found it yet online or if not it would be a really interesting way to play it would you do it would you do it i think i would i think i would like to have because i can't see how it would be i want to know how it would be different yeah and it would have a completely different effect on it and how how do you get that to be not just completely icky because the rate the rachel again every time i say ross and rachel in this i'm doing inverted (laughs) commas they can see me on the skype but you guys can't (laughs) um but every rachel's nowhere near as I, I, well, at least I feel sympathy for the Rachel character. Oh, one hundred percent. And would you feel that if it was a male saying those lines? Yeah, she, she's not. She's no. not as harshly written as the Ross character. I completely agree. And the more you say that, actually, the more it makes me think I definitely wouldn't cast a male actor, mm. um, because I think the potential to hate that character is quite high. And I think if you then put that to a male voice, potentially you would lose all of that sympathy. Let's say I would workshop it with a male character, a male actor. I would like to workshop it and see what we do. We'll do that. 
what do you feel about it says this could be any other couple mm-hmm. but there is if you know Ross and Rachel and you know friends there are so many references within the play text I find that are so specific to to the show there's one there's one that is my absolute favorite and it just is where's my dinosaur tie mm. and I think that is just <laughs> there's no way if you read the title Ross and Rachel and you know that line like, I don't know why I picked that one out, because there's loads more. There's, like, references to the lobster, the stuff about his sister. There's loads more that are way more specific. But for me, that dinosaur tie just really sticks out. Um, sorry, what was the actual question? <laughs> I got distracted no, by the dinosaur I was, tie. I was just talking about that. If you know Friends, there are so many references. I don't understand on one level how you can say it could not not be about them when so much of the context, like the lobster thing, has... So what is the lobster? So she dreams of dancing with a six-foot lobster, does Rachel. And in the Friends world, that immediately has context for us all. But if we're not in the Friends world, isn't that a bit like, what the hell? Why would you dream about the... This lobster has so much romantic connotations in Friends, but does a lobster have romantic connotations outside of Friends? Well, I don't know, because I've only ever seen it as the Friends reference, so I don't... Like, if someone is your lobster, <laughs> then... She's her lobster! <laughs> then, yeah, it is romantic, because you know the history. But So I don't... I couldn't possibly answer that. Maybe I should ask Alex, because she she's obviously saw the play and didn't have any reference to Friends. Although, actually, no, I think I remember her saying... I think she said something along the lines of, what the hell was that lobster thing about? You see? I mean, yeah, and on the face of it... You could totally read this play and get that it's just a couple going through something, but I think it's got so much more heart and so much more backstory. Is all, the backstory is already there for us? Essentially, before we even open page one, the backstory is there. You, it saves Fritz having to do a shed load of legwork in setting up this couple because we immediately know where they are on page one in their lives. Do you know what's interesting as well? I don't know if I'm kind of going off topic. It's just something that came into my head there. Is you know how, so since Netflix became a big thing, Friends get put on Netflix, everyone rewatches Netflix, everyone goes, oh, hang on, Ross was actually horrible. Yes, I was going to say this. <laughs> and, and it's kind of like, because this obviously premiered in 2015, he's kind of taken the context of that, you know, it's not the 90s anymore. It's Yeah, I completely agree with you. It's that interesting thing about watching the series or referencing the series now with our 2020 um, glasses on we're all managing to call out a lot more of the, you know, ick behaviour by Ross. So, like, the issues yeah, he had with yeah. the nanny and making a move on his cousin, which is probably not good in any time period. Absolutely not. <laughs> but I don't... Now we're all going, hold on. And also, I'm sorry, Rachel should have ended up with Joey. She was much better suited to him. That's just my opinion. And there was an amazing Twitter thread about it about a couple of years ago, which said it Incredible. all. Incredible. I'm not disagreeing to be fair. <laughs> but it's really confusing equating this character with Ross on one hand now because if I didn't know this play had their connotations and references from the point I'd be really anti this voice as a controlling douche um, yeah. and 16 year down the line like I say we're watching it with these glasses on but he was meant to be a member of the core gang we're meant to root for and for this guy in this play I don't so there's mm-hmm. that yeah, no. Weird juxtaposition there. Whereas if you probably don't know Friends, it's easier to make a clean read on the character. Whereas if you do, you're like, but it's Ross. It's so clever, though. Like, don't you think the ability to write a play that works on those two levels is just... It's incredible. It is such a fantastic, fantastic script. I mean, I love it. And it talks about that it's got the levels of the patriarchy, she says, shaking mm-hmm. her fist. <laughs> it, 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 it raises that brilliant question: Why is her name always second? It's it's, and she says she she yeah. always asks, she asks it. She says, "When somebody emails you something that's meant for both of us, I don't see why they can't just email me as well." And Ross replies, "It's just easier that way, Rachel. But it's always you." And it's like, oh, I love that little bit of dialogue. I'm like, yes, mm-hmm. the patriarchy. <laughs> yeah. I think what I do love in this play as well. I really love the punctuation. Yes. I think it adds... When you're reading... Have you, have you read this out loud? Yet? No. My, you should um, do that. You should totally I do I may that. have to. I might get a cat in and have a cat listen to me read it and give him a one-man play because there's nothing else to do at the moment. <laughs> yeah, that is true. <laughs> so what, tell me about reading it out loud. Yeah, so when I began to read it out loud, I think the punctuation kind of 
comes into its own a bit there as well. I have the tendency, because I rush everything in my life, um, to skim read and not really take notice to it. But when you really listen to the punctuation, especially without ruining anything, on the last page as well. Oh, we can ruin it. We've told them we're doing this play if they want to listen to it. We are <laughs> here. Spoiler. Had spoiler. <laughs> we're talking about the play in its whole. Spoiler alert. Continue. Okay, so he dies. Hashtag spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the gaps as well. And the different thought patterns. and. So we can, we'll post some pages of the pictures on here. But yeah, I think like this play, it's really interesting when he gives them full stops and when he doesn't. So I'm going to just read a little bit from page from the very first page and tell you when there's... I'll try and sound like there's no full stop and try and sound like there is a full stop. So, sometimes I just get really fucking sick of it. Don't you? No. Never. No. I've always loved it. I don't know why you'd... It's nothing to do with you. It's just... What? Don't worry about it. And there's so many of these bits where people just... It's not even like there's an ellipsis to trail off. It's just, it, why you'd nothing. It's just nothing. And it just makes the full stop yeah. feel really finite, I think. Like someone's yeah. closing a conversation. When they don't, it feels like there's so much being unsaid just through punctuation, which I love. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm just thinking about that little laugh to myself there was the stereotypes of men and women in arguments. And... Ah, the, go for but it. I think this is actually the other way around though, isn't it? I'm trying to think. Would that be sometimes I just get really fucking sick of it, don't you? That would be Rachel's voice, wouldn't it? Yeah. And so she's kind of Yeah. She's asking the questions, she's opening it up, she hasn't got the full stops, and then you get to Ross in inverted commas lines and they are all the full stops and they're No, it's nothing, don't worry. Because he's much more sure of where their relationship mm. is going. And she's not. Interesting. Yeah. It's one of the challenges of this show, though, I think, is delineating the two characters really clearly and yes. making those decisions. Is If you were directing this or even just reading it, it's sometimes I find it... Because there's no... There's no like gaps to say, yes, this chunk is this person and this chunk, yeah. chunk, chunk is this next person. It's just, it yeah. runs straight on every line. And sometimes two lines together might be the same person. I wonder if you'd ever, you'd ever get uh, disagreements in that because between kind of the director and the actor and thinking, oh no, that's a, that's a her line. And then them saying, no, it's not. Well, I saw there was a really interesting review so i obviously didn't see this production but i was reading about it online there was a production by different theater at the brighton fringe from uh, may 2019 and the review of this fringe uh, show said that in this version rachel has the tumor in the production at the start and then it switches uh, to being ross what <laughs> I know. Wow. So, so, like, it's in one brain set and then it switches. So I don't know if, obviously, having not seen the production, if that's uh, the reviewers interpreted it correctly, but assuming they have, that's really interesting. Because I don't even know say how it could you have do been. that. Because there's nothing to say, because we, we just naturally interpret based on the voice, which is which. Yeah, and, and you do not... that, like, based on, you know, so I'm reading it and I think, oh, well, that's obviously that line because it's only me reading it and I'm not talking about it with anyone else until now. <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah, that's amazing. So that would be a really interesting version to play around with, I think. I think absolutely, yeah. Ooh, here's a question for you. So there's moments in this play, guys, where the characters seem to be addressing the audience directly, um, where or sort of addressing somebody directly, somebody who isn't Ross or Rachel. So there's bits where he's talking about... Um, I mean, we were on again, off again, on again, off again, off again for so long. Well, you know, you were there. But there's no clear indication as to who they're talking to. I think, yeah, I think they're talking to the other friends. Ooh. Yeah. Um, and as to whether the audience are the other friends or whether, you know, you play it to an, I don't know, empty chair. Well, this is the thing. I was wondering, because as we go further down the play, Ross, inverted commas, um, starts having these 
long drawn out um i'm going to call them like dream or fantasy sequences which are marked in italics so that's at least one thing you can try and delineate quite nicely but it's uh, basically he's going more and more into what he wants the world to be like and in, and he wants to like live in a sitcom it sounds like uh so i'm trying to find an example I know, well, the production I saw, which was, it was directed by Thomas Martin, um, the actress, Molly, she, to my memory, again, five years ago, um, she did address the audience and she did speak to us. And it was in, it was a very small space, um, but it felt very intimate. And it, it, was, it was as if we were having a conversation with her, which I absolutely loved. I think to put the show in a massive theatre with loads of seats would be an absolute waste. Oh yeah, it's yeah. definitely an intimate piece. Yeah. So, so this is a bit. So Ross says, "I want to strike up a friendship with a sassy nurse who says something sassy at precisely the right moment to break the tension, and etc. Cetera, etc." Cetera. Wouldn't everybody love that? And part of me wonders if the who he's talking to in those moments is like a TV audience in his head. Mm. So it's a bit pleasant village where he's imagined this world now. And his life is this sitcom where everything works out brilliantly and that's a link to that. And and these direct addresses to this TV audience who would love his life to work out the, the you know the right way. So what do you, if that's his interpretation, what do you think her interpretation of it is? Because it's not a sitcom for her, is it? No. Do you think oh, it's... Oh, that's a good question. Because I feel I completely agree with you that it is like that for the male voice. I'm try- really trying not to say Ross and Rachel so we don't get mi- yeah 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 mixed up in saying Ross and Rachel but you're doing far better than me <laughs> <laughs> I think the female voice is, a- is more intimate mm. but is that just because she's a female <laughs> and because we are more open to talking about things like that and would that change if it was a male performer doing it yeah ah <laughs> questions <laughs> See, this is what this podcast is basically, guys. It's for, it's for me and Meg to talk out and work out our shit about this play yeah. and just pose a lot more questions at each other. But yeah, I think who you're directing it to is really interesting. So, Lexi, if you directed this piece, who would you want them to talk to? I think you can play it like they're both talking to the audience, but the audience is something different for both of them. So for Ross, it's like this really engaged TV audience sitcom friend. And for Rachel, I don't know, it feels like someone she'd probably talk to. It's a different sort of audience, isn't it? See her, like, stubbing out cigarettes on a fire escape, talking to somebody about this, somebody who's not got any direct involvement. She, I don't know if she would talk to the likes of, like, Monica, Monica. or Phoebe or her friends about this. It has to feel like a stranger. And that's that's who the audience is to her. It's somebody she doesn't know and doesn't okay. who doesn't care about her life. Whereas for the male voice, it's someone who's deeply invested in his life. Because sometimes it's easier to be open if you're talking to a stranger, right? Mm. And her thoughts are, are kind of new. They're kind of like, oh, I've just realised I actually don't want to be with him. Whereas mm. everything Ross is saying, the male voice is saying, is... You know, everything that he's saying, he's said since the start of episode one, series one, Friends. No, you're right, yeah, he's, it's, that character hasn't moved on. That character feels stagnant, almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But beautifully written, so it's, 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 it's taking that what happens when, you know, one, when you bow into almost peer pressure, essentially, and just go with the fantasy life that you're meant to have. So, here's a... I tell you what, there's lots of pop culture references in this script as well, guys, which is really interesting. So we have the male voice constantly harking back to ideal romanticists. So we have a a Titanic reference. Um, Suddenly we're on the stairs of the Titanic and we're kissing and all our old friends from the boat are bursting into applause. And then Meg named this reference. Um, She's just a girl standing in front of a boy. (laughs) Notting Hill. Notting Hill. (laughs) We love not a bit, love a bit of Notting Hill, so it's what a great pop- quote as well. I, I mean, who wrote Notting Hill? Richard Curtis, probably. I feel like that's a safe, that's a safe guess. That's a, that's a safe bet for my questioning tone. <laughs> what great dialogue, but all these romantic connotations are just peppered throughout the script as well. These ideals of love, which 
I think up to up to this point where we all started questioning, rewatching Friends and questioning it, Ross and Rachel was counted in that as one of the ideas yeah. as well. It was Romeo and Juliet, Ross and Rachel, Jack and Rose, all these big couples names. <laughs> who I who all ultimately die. <laughs> this is true. It's just... <laughs> Love is only tragic when it involves death. <laughs> <laughs> just, oh god! I just thought the Romeo and Juliet has done something similar actually with Anne Juliet the musical because that's what happened if Juliet wanted to get a life after Rome after the whole thing and didn't die. Well, let's all learn a lesson from that, shall we, girls? <laughs> Great. So I tell you what I really like about this as well. Not really like so it, when it gets really bleak towards the end and the male voice says basically tries to spin killing themselves together so that that's a turner uh, right oh i mean it mm. it comes really creepily mm-hmm. um here's it now that's an idea a way for this to end where god wouldn't that be jesus christ what's the matter with me think about something else and then it couldn't help can't help coming back to the same idea would she consider it i could ask her Ugh. it's so so creepy and then we have this amazing like page and a bit long description about how it would play out if it was and it's it's so creepy um and it's always in italicized fantasies but it's not a terrible tragedy this is the perfect end to our story and that's been obvious right from the start um we write out a note to the kids and a second note to our friends but it's full of references to jokes we made in our youth and they go up and run a bit oh everyone laughs a sad laugh hand in hand we who's everyone who is everyone in this again it's this audience everyone yeah. laughs a sad laugh hand in hand we go upstairs and we prepare to run our bath the one with the perfect ending and then what i find really interesting is so we've done this you know the bath fails to the brim not so it spills we kiss a kiss that has the audience on its feet and then everyone sighs and then they then he goes I pass her the razor and she smiles a thing and then a short gasp as the water turns red I hold her hand and I hold the razor and I count to three and the perfect ending death by slit wrists is a really I don't know it feels like a very aggressive aggressive way to do it even in his fantasy yeah I think it's about it's kind of an intimate thing as well isn't it it's kind of a let let our blood merge together in the water. I can imagine if you were to romanticise death, it would have something to do with blood coming together, potentially. Mm. It, yeah, it, it just, it really piles on the creep and the ick factor, doesn't it? It just, it really changes the play. I think you start off reading it and you think, oh, this is hilarious, this is really funny, it's a play, you know, I get the references, oh, ha, 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 oh, hang on, what's happening? Mm. which is brilliant and i love that um should we talk about coffee oh yes i love coffee (laughs) Coffee, let's talk about coffee coffee coffee. so the coffee uh, in the script let me just find it page 13 so yeah in the script there is one section where they are in the hospital um the nurses, the doctors, they're asking them, are you okay? Is everything okay? What's going on? Would you like a coffee? What's going on? What's going on? In fact, shall I just read it out? Wait, please do. (laughs) Okay, so there's a bit in the script where they're in the hospital and it kind of goes, so you've got, thank you for the flowers, I'm going to be sick. Coffee, side effects, oh, coffee, juice, cream, what time's the appointment? Do you take sugar? Oh, so great to see you. I thought you'd never leave. Beer? And it goes on like that for a couple of pages. And then you just get to this one section where the word coffee with a question mark is repeated like 30 times. Uh, it's coffee for nine. Then can I get you a coffee? And then 26 more coffees. I there we go. Wow. So that I just think, I don't know. That's just insane. Oh, go on. Do it. <laughs> Re- read it. Read it out. Read the coffee bit. Go on. Okay. Coffee, 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 coffee. Coffee, can I get you a coffee? Coffee, 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 coffee. Wait. After a while the word coffee seems to lose all meaning as I heard you say it. Yeah, it's it's honestly the most bizarre thing, and I think when I came out of the theatre, that is that is the moment you remember. Mmm. Coffee, coffee. Everyone, you hear them on the way out. Oh, we did a coffee bit. Oh, that was really good. Coffee, coffee, coffee. Yeah, coffee. Oh. It's, it's so real, though, isn't it? Because when you have these sorts of 
tragedies or or these incidents in life you immediately put on the need to host don't you and to put on Mm -hmm. a mask to others sometimes and the only way to kind of distance is to have that constant action of tea coffee just something to Mm -hmm. keep doing so it feels really real in that regard yeah any situation would you like a cup of tea and you go back to it near the end of the play when they're back in hospital near the end you get um he hasn't woken up at all this morning coffee so when he's in he's in the hospital it, it just keeps circling around that idea about coffee i mean you just it just makes you think doesn't it gosh people in that situation they must just be so sick of hearing things like that uh, yeah it's that repetition and there's yeah. nothing else to do I, what i love about this is when you get a bit further into play as well it changes from it goes coffee beer come in sit down we're watching tv and then the uh, the female voice goes he looks tired his face looks old I'll have another glass of wine and I love that it switches mm. from being coffee to wine mm-hmm. because I think that's just th- there's something else about it being turning to the alcohol that uh, tells you more about where they're both at in their heads mm-hmm. which is really interesting I wonder why it's not tea mm, is it an American thing because yes. Americans make terrible terrible tea no offense of any Americans listening but I did a two months in a summer camp. I remember I could not drink the stuff, but the coffee was damn good. But then, if the actor's doing it in their own accent, I don't know, is it just just as simple as coffee is universal? Maybe. Yeah, I mean, also, let's say, tea, 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 do you want a tea? Tea, 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 yeah. Maybe tea starts to sound like the letter more so than the drink after a while as well. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. But I do think you're right. I think for a UK setting or text or audience, tea would be the one we don't immediately go for in situations. Mm. We always go, do you want tea? Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean, yeah. So it further connotates it to that Amer- to the American characterization. Yeah. Oh, you know what I love? And I only got this when I reread it so much about this and we talk about the how readable this play is without knowing the friend's context but one of the very last lines from the male voice before he passes away so this is the very last page of dialogue don't let me no one told me what is where is water water my mouth i am what's happening what's no one told me no one told me no one told me no 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 please i mean but apart from anything else that's just a oh that's a bit of a di- mm. chunk of dialogue but i love that either conscious or subconscious link to the friends theme song where mm. it also goes um so no one told you life was going to be this way and then you've got no one told me no one told me and you just put the end of that no one told me life was going to be this way it's like oh that just really yeah, it hits you on another level an absolute killer of the last page and the reaction it just it just really does make just go and it's got that amazing this the last page we'll post a picture of this on on our social media channels but the layout on the last page again is gorgeous where there's this chunk of the male voice and then it's a gap please one line as a line's worth a gap i'm thirsty i'm and then there's like six lines gap i think that's it it's just me couple more gaps oh and then a couple more gaps i'm the only one here so it has this the layout of the text feels like someone struggling to say much and to breathe and it feels slow as he as he passes away and it feels like it has that silence in a hospital room when you have the flat line and and you have that immediate i'm the only one left it feels like the silence is there in the textual layout on the script which i freaking love it's absolutely heartbreaking and stunning so for you what are the main themes in this piece what would you want to kind of explore with it i think it and this is this sounds like a very strange thing to say given the kind of position we are in at the very moment Mm -hmm. Um, it really makes you think about what you have and how much time you have with people Mm. Because she spends the majority of the play, you know, saying negative things about him, saying she doesn't want to be with him anymore, and then, and then he just goes. 
And I think for me, that's what that's what I take from it. I think it makes me think you just don't know how much time you have with the ones you love. Mm. And that's really. I think. I think ultimately, it's actually a really sad play. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's you know, which is kind of interesting because it's come from, you know, probably the biggest comedy sitcom there's ever been, and very true. And I think it's heartbreaking. Mm. I really like. If I was going to stage this, I'd be really wanting to play around with this idea, with these like, expectation, the idea of expectation and peer pressure and how hard it is to break free of some a relationship like that when everyone expects you to be in it. Yeah. And I, I think that I think the the female voice in this is so interesting, and I I really love. So we've talked about this about what I'd want to do with this and how I'm staging it, but I love the whole the, the prevalence of the coffee and the using it as a mask, and I would so want us so I would stage this with just the entire floor of the set being littered with coffee mugs, um, half-filled coffee mugs, which the person would just keep going to, and then halfway through it just switches and it becomes wine, and she starts bringing out wine and then the coffee, so it's that loss of it. control, and then I guess littering everywhere, so that's that's where I'd be going with this if I have got a chance to work on it. It's strange because it's sort of a, a story about independence as well, because mm. even as she starts off the play saying, why are we always together? Why are our names always together? And then the very last line is, I'm the only one here. And actually, I've just thought about this right now. Maybe that's not a sad thing. Maybe that line's a good thing. I don't know. That's interesting. That's a different way to play that very, very last line. Yeah. I'm the only one here. Maybe that's strong. Maybe that's like, finally, it's just me and I can do what I want to do. Yeah, you're right, actually, because you, the automatic response is to go, he's gone, shell shock. I, this wasn't what I was expecting, almost. But actually, it could be really empowering yeah. to play it with a small smile on the face. Like, Absolutely. I've got the peace. And while no one else is around at that moment, to have that moment. Like a relief. Because mm. there's a really lovely whole chunk in this about when she talks about what she'll have afterwards, when she thinks, you know, I'll, I will be really good at my job and I might meet someone in the future and we'll have a small wedding in the spring and after the honeymoon we move to Paris where I've always dreamed of working. So it, she's really excited about her independence. And she's finally got that. Mm. Wow, I love this because I feel like my entire opinion on this play has just changed. Like that. Hey! And I, like, I think that's the best thing about talking about plays. I think, you know, I've been reading this for like, yeah, for like years and years and now just talking to you about it it's like everything's changed because i've just changed the interpretation of that last line and i just think that the the fact that a playwright can do that and can just you know give you these enormous amount of possibilities of how you can play the show mm. oh i just think it's amazing i just think our playwrights are amazing aren't they <laughs> like I live with one of them. <laughs> you do, you do. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, they are pretty special, special people. And yeah. this is a, I think we can both agree that we thoroughly recommend Ross and Rachel. If you haven't read it already, go and read it, especially if you're someone who's looking for an um, amazing monologue as a solo performer. Yeah. Or especially if, if, I think if you've read Friends, there's even more to get from it. If you've read Friends, if you've seen Friends, but even without, there is, it's such a beautifully nuanced look at relationships and the hard work of them and what we don't see behind people's uh, outward exteriors and what they present to the world that there's so much to get from this script and it's an absolute corker it's a great one if you're looking for audition pieces as well i always say that to people whenever they're like what can i do for audition i'm like just read this play because it's you know 32 pages worth and you're sure to like a bit of it <laughs> <laughs> very true so I think that kind of wraps up probably Ross and Rachel, I would say. Well, it's been really fun. Yay! Episode Amazing. one done. <laughs> so next week on our episode two, we are looking at Little Baby Jesus by Rinze Kenne, which is super exciting. Very exciting. And another one, Mega Scene Live, which I have not, so she'll have tons to say. So yeah, if you want to join in with the discussion, then you have a week to read the play, get up to speed, and then you can join in, listen, and you'll kind of know a bit more about what we're talking about. And don't forget to mention us on the social media as well. We are at Script in Hand Pod on Twitter, on Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, I have been Lexi Ward. I have been Meg Robinson. Uh, you can get me on Twitter at LexiW99. And I'm at Meg Robinson 94 
Oh, both 90s. 90s. I'd like to say it mine was my birthday, but my birth year, but I'm not that young, sadly. <laughs> and a big shout out to uh, Connor Barton, who has done our amazing music for this. I yes. love our music. I'm going to call out how amazingly 80s it sounds, but it's great because it makes me want to bop along with it. So thank you, Connor, for that. So as it comes time to sign off, we decided that for all of our sign offs, we're going to give you the coolest or weirdest stage direction we can find that week, either from the play we've been reading about or just one that's really taken our fancy. And as Ross and Rachel hasn't got any, we've gone for probably one of the most famous directions. So as we exit Pursued by a Bear, we'll see you next week. <laughs>